Today, I'm pretending to be a Cisco Enterprise Network Administrator from 2002. These are Cisco PIX firewalls, all over 20 years old. Firewalls, of course, block unwanted traffic from coming into your network and only allow egress out of your networks that you allow. This is a pair of PIX 515Es and a tiny PIX 506E. These units can also perform network address translation, or NAT. This allows an internal network with many machines and private IPs to share a single public IP like the one an ISP would provide. This would have been a pretty killer feature in the 90s when this PIX line first came out. They're also pretty interesting because they basically use commodity hardware, x86 hardware. This little guy here actually has a Pentium 2 inside. And he's also sustained some physical damage. We'll fix that up and get a network running on him. Then we'll move our attention onto these big guys and get a network set up on them. We'll try to take it one step further with this high-speed special serial cable that you can connect two of the units with. One can act as a primary, the other as a secondary. When something goes wrong with the primary, like a power or other hardware failure, the secondary will take over as the firewall. We'll see how that goes though, it looks a little involved. Getting a couple of these units working is an important step on my journey to eventually having a Puri Correct 2000s Enterprise Rack, complete with network gear and various servers that I own. Let's get into it. Let's start digging into these Cisco PIX firewall units from the early 2000s. This is a 506E. These are two 515Es. Both of these models came out in 2002. This, of course, is a smaller one meant for smaller businesses. These are a little more serious, as we'll see when we dive into them. I got this one on eBay. These came in a Craigslist slot with some other stuff. They belong to the same company, FedEx, apparently. And I made a big mistake. You can see they both have a secondary label on them. They are both licensed as secondary failover units, meaning they can't be used as primary firewalls the way this one can. So we'll have to deal with that. This 506E has sustained some uh, shipping damage as usual. A little bend here. Got some of the aftermath of that. This was rolling around in the case. So we'll have to dig into that. You connect to all of them with this Cisco style serial console. I don't know if Cisco invented it, but this pinout with the RJ45 to serial is commonly referred to as a Cisco cable. And I'll tell you, it is very satisfying to plug this light blue cable into the light blue color-coded console port on the back of all these units for some reason. A rare treat, I guess. So we're gonna dive into this 506E first and get it running, do some minor repair work on it, see if we can get a basic network going with it. And then we'll dive into the 515Es, see if we can figure out our licensing issue. And I have the special failover cable. So the ultimate goal here is to turn one of these into a primary and fail it over to the secondary. See how that goes. I will say I really like it when companies keep the same design aesthetic across models, even vastly different form factors like this. I really like that they had the same design. Let's dive into this 506E. Let's do a quick walk around. On the front we've got the indicator lights and of course this thing just falls off because some plastic clips used to go into these holes. I have the remnants of one of them, so I don't think I'm gonna be able to save that. We'll figure out a plan for reattaching that if we can validate that this works. Around back, it's got two 10100 ethernet interfaces, zero and one, often referred to as outside and inside. We'll dive into that. A USB console port, I believe, USB to console. And then here is the regular console port where you would plug in your Cisco console cable. A little power switch on the side, and then this thing what I believe is a proprietary power connector into a brick you're gonna have to have to power this unit. It only needs plus five, plus 12, minus 12. I mean, you're getting my unbiased review. Cisco did not send me this unit. They should have just put this stuff in the case. I know that it probably saved them some money and they were all able to, you know, trim, share some of that price savings with the consumer, but I just hate it when, especially, you know, over 20 years later, I'm, you know, trying to hunt one of these down such a pain. It, it, I think it really eats into the longevity of these units. And I think it's a shame when companies do stuff like that, but that's no problem. I've got it. So we're going to power this thing up, get a network going with it, validate that it works fine. And then we'll see what we can do about these repairs. Just for some quick historical context, these PIX units have been around a really long time. So they were originally developed by a company called Network Translation in the early 90s. Cisco acquired them in 1995. And as early as 1996, on a scrape from the Cisco website, we can see mention 
of the PIX firewalls. The 506E we're about to look at, I think came out in 2002, and the PIX line was entirely end of sale in 2008, end of life fully happening in 2013. So these things haven't even been supported for 10 years, and they started in the early 90s. I bring this up because it's always interesting. I mean, we're just gonna fire them up and they're gonna power right on. Really interesting to use machines that have such a long lineage, are old themselves, the physical units I have, and then existed well into the 2010s. If you want a documentary style historical overview of these units, the Serial Port did a great video and they interviewed the folks that were involved in everything. So definitely go check that out if this interests you at all. While we're here, also on the Cisco homepage from 1996 is this thing. Gotta see that. We know where your friends are. Is that a threat? Is this like one of those kidnapper letters? This typography, this font treatment was everywhere in the early 90s. Textbooks, everything. Who is responsible for this? <laughs> and why did they think it was a good idea? Cisco, friends at Cisco. Number one place to work in 1996 Computer World Survey. Sears Roebuck and Company was number four, so do with that information what you will. Let's start by getting familiar with this PIX 506E. I'm connected via the serial console here and I'm gonna issue a reload command and this is what it's gonna look like right when it boots up and you're watching on the serial console. Starts by hitting some embedded firmware here from 01 or 02 it looks like and then you can see it's counting down and if I was to break now I could use TFTP to reset the password, we'll do that shortly, but if you let it continue we're gonna continue on to the PIX software itself. There it goes. Let it do its thing. All right, so scroll up here. The private internet exchange, that's what PIX stands for. Cisco PIX firewall, we're running version 6.3 from 2003, I believe. This is always great to see the ASCII art of the Cisco systems logo. That's the Golden Gate Bridge, by the way. And then we can talk a little bit about licensing. So this thing has what's called a restricted license. For all intents and purposes on this one, it just means I can't fail over. I'm not allowed to fail over and there's no actually no physical ports for me to fail over with anyway so that's not a big deal. When we get into the big ones there's three main licenses we care about restricted, unrestricted, and then a failover only license which those two have and we'll dive in deeper when we get to the 515s but if we scroll down we're at a terminal prompt you can always press question mark to see what you're allowed to do. When you're messing with these PIX machines you're really always going to want to be in uh, exec mode or privilege command mode. You get in there with enable or en. By default, might not have a password or the password will be Cisco. So someone factory reset this one before I got it off eBay and there was no password. So now you can see the terminal prompt has changed from, from this greater than symbol to a hash, meaning I'm in privileged mode. And if we type question here, there's a lot more commands. And this is where you actually get in and configure the interfaces and set up NAT and routing and all that. What we're gonna do is get into configure T, that stands for configure terminal. This is where the vast majority of your operations take place and you know you're in this mode with the config. As always, question mark again, there's a lot of stuff to do in here, but we're gonna say enable password and set ourselves a password. And you can hop back out of these modes as you might expect with exit. So now I'm in the exec mode, exit again. Now I'm in that basic mode that I was in before. And now when we try to get into the more privileged mode, the password has been set, of course. So pretend you don't know what that password is, which is very likely the case if you're picking one of these up. Let me show you that process to reset it. The process to reset these passwords is pretty well documented on the internet, but I got tripped up in a couple places that I wanna show you. So basically you have to set up a TFTP server on another machine. That's really straightforward. Tons of documentation out there on that. But you also need the right binary file to load over TFTP to reflash the machine. It's like a little utility that resets the password. And it's specific to the version of the PIX firewall version you're running. All the examples online will imply that you need to grab the BIOS version to figure out which binary you need. But that's not actually the case. You need the PIX version. Let's reload this thing again and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So right when it boots, you see this embedded BIOS version 4.3 or 4.2. So it's easy to think I need the 4.2 version of the binary, but you don't. You actually want the PIX firewall software version, which is going to show up in just a second. So this is the important number right here. Firewall version 6.3. That's the binary we need. By some miracle, Cisco did not have these behind a login paywall. They're, of course, not hosting them anymore. So we go here. 
if I go try to download the 6.3 binary tool we need, it's, it's just some landing page for Cisco. But the archive scrape this. So you can plug this into archive.org just like this. And sure enough, you can see no problem downloading it. Over here on one of the worker VMs in my home lab, I do actually use these things, by the way. I've got a TFTP folder and it's hosting that NP63 bin we downloaded from Cisco. Well, from the archive anyway. And it's IP address we're gonna need. It's in my network at 192.168.182. Back over at the PICS, let's reload. And I'm gonna hit escape when it prompts me to get into something called monitor mode. All right, so now we're at the monitor prompt. By default, the monitor prompt is interacting with interface one. I've got that plugged into my network. We're gonna give it an IP address. Hopefully this one's free. <laughs> I don't actually know. And then we'll tell it the TFTP server. Remember that was 82. And then we're gonna tell it which file name to transfer. So MP63 in our case. And then we're going to make sure we can actually talk to that server. We can, that's a good sign. Then we'll kick off the process with this TFTP command, the file name at the server. And you can see it grabbed it. It knows that it's the Cisco secure PIX firewall password tool. That's great. We can say erase password and it's just showing us the current password configuration. We can say, yep, get rid of that. We're going to reboot. All right, we're here. Let's try to get to privileged mode. It's either blank or Cisco blank. Remember, we just set that password to Cloud Retro, did our TFTP funny business, and now it's reset. So that's how you can unlock these things after you buy them. Okay, let's go over the basic network we want to set up with this PIX 506E. This will be a sort of simple version. We'll get a little more sophisticated with failover when we start looking at those bigger 515E units. I'm no network engineer, so I'm going to keep this brief. I know these can be very boring to look at, but basically we've got the PIX in the middle here, and it has two interfaces on it. These are referred to as the outside and inside interface, typically in Cisco nomenclature. And if you don't believe me, you can see that the previous owner actually even labeled them as such. Typically your outside network is everything before the firewall and your inside network is everything the firewall is protecting. Outside typically being the internet or something. In my case, it's slightly more complicated. I already have a network that I'm gonna plug this into. That's my UDM Pro connected to the internet. So this is my existing home network here. And I'm gonna assign the outside interface an IP on that network. In our case, 192.168.1.254. Everything inside the firewall is gonna be on this 10.0.0.whatever network, just so we can see the difference here. So my inside interface is gonna be 10.0.0.1, and all the computers inside, in my example here, it's 10.0.0.11, are gonna be on that network. And we'll set up some network address translation, the PIX killer feature, really, in the early 90s, to link these two networks together, and I'll be able to use the internet from this one with this local IP and it'll flow through the PICs. It'll forward that onto my router, to the internet and back. You can get way more sophisticated with VPNs and stuff, but we're just gonna see if we can get this basic network running. Let's consult the Cisco PICs 506E firewall guide where this guy is gonna help us get set up. Back at the PICs, I've been messing around. I think I've got it down. We're going to erase all its settings Looks like you can configure it through interactive prompts. I don't actually know how to do that. I'm gonna to try to configure it by hand, so we're gonna skip that. Let's get into configure terminal. All right, so remember there was two interfaces on that thing. You typically call them inside and outside, like the diagram. So I'm gonna set this thing up with a bunch of basic commands, including naming those interfaces. So for example, I can name interface ethernet zero outside and set it at the highest security level or the most strict security level. And of course I can name the other one with the weakest security level. I'm gonna go through and now I can reference the interfaces by name inside, outside. Another good example is I can say IP address inside is 10.0.0.1. If you remember from our diagram, that mask. So I'm gonna cruise through, enter a bunch of commands and we'll see if we can get this thing working, matching our topology from our diagram. Done for now, see if it worked. So you can always say show run and it'll spit out all of its settings that you're about to write to memory. So everything I've done is in its working memory and I haven't persisted it and made it settings yet. 
And using the CLI, so I've never actually used iOS, Cisco's other command line utility. This is the PIX software. I think they're quite similar though. iOS is definitely older than PIX. Maybe they, they probably branched and merged and inspired each other. Uh, not sure about that, but it really grows on you. So you can type, type like sh run for show run, or I can type it out entirely, show run. You sort of start to get a feel for it. Uh, anyway, so we can write the memory. So theoretically now we can go plug a real machine into our inside interface. It should get an IP. We should be able to use it. Okay, let's see if we can call ourselves certified 2003 PIX administrators. It is hard to believe this thing is 20 years old, over 20 years old. The outside interface going to my network in my house. The inside interface going to this machine up here. I'll point you at the screen. We'll see how we did. This is that Linux machine. Let's do IPA. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. We have a 10.0.0.10 IP address, just like we expect. Can we hit the outside world? We can. <laughs> this is so cool. Okay. Back to our diagram. This one is here with a dot 10 address and it goes through the picks. We have the right settings to allow traffic through and it'll hop to my real router and onto the internet and, and back of course when we're browsing the web or whatever. Awesome. Let's crack this thing open and see if we can't get it all fixed up. I have been in here once before to find this that was rattling around. Get this cover off. Slides like that. Very simple. Here's our beautiful Pentium 2. And what do we have here? Some Samsung RAM that I'm sure you had to pay a pretty penny to Cisco for. Okay, I guess our first port of call is gonna be soldering this battery back on. Get the iron warmed up here. Probably take this back out, actually. Very good diagram for the obvious spot that this goes in, that's nice. This battery was very dead, of course. I'm not really sure about the best way to do this. I am not good at soldering. I think I'm gonna to try to get a little bit on the pads. It's borderline surface mount stuff going on here. Yeah, I think that's gonna work pretty well, actually. Then what I'm gonna do, lay that in there, and then I'll try to just briefly heat up what I had to get it to tack a little bit maybe. This is not an electronics repair channel, as you can tell. I think I got one. Yep. Believe it or not, we've done it. Let that cool off for a little bit. Let's turn our attention to the front here. So these little guys, three of them used to form together like that. And they would be on this guy to poke into these holes. And that's just not gonna be repairable, nor do I have all the pieces anyway. So here's what I'm thinking. On the back side here, I'm just gonna take some Velcro pads and Velcro it to the front. Our problem though, is that it's not flat. There's this huge cavity here uh, that I need to fill somehow with something strong to put the Velcro against. So let me find something. Ooh, we have another issue. See how it lays flush here, not over here. This whole thing, the whole case, this piece here got dented that way. See if we can pry that back, that's gonna help us. That's probably how all these plastic bits shattered. This probably banged on its corner like that in a previous life. Luckily, it's not a big deal if I hurt this paint on the front, though I appreciate Cisco's attention to detail. This is really nice paint. I'm just gonna clamp these on there. Something like that. Let's check our fit. Oh, much better. All right, that's great. Okay, let me find something to fill in here that we can attach our Velcro to. As someone who prides themselves on keeping absolutely everything, it took me an embarrassingly long time to find something to fill this void so that we could do the Velcro thing, but I came up with something even better. These are two, some post mount things from a really crappy GoPro mount kit I got, and they thread into these remaining plastic holes perfectly. They're really strong. So what we're gonna do is come over here, come through the hole like that, and just thread right in, and we'll attach it to the front that way. I think that's gonna work out really well. I've got some 
plastic spacers to use because these are too long and I can't be bothered to grind them down tonight anyway. Uh, so I've got some plastic spacers from the same aforementioned very crappy GoPro kit. And yeah, we're just gonna do something like this. See how it goes. Oh yeah, look at that. It's tight. No worse than the factory original. And it's a relief that all I have to do is throw a couple of these plastic bits on there. Now the trick is can I, I might have to unplug this for a while. Tight quarters here, but we'll make it work. Oh yeah, good as new. Can I sneak this in, get away with this? Yep, I am real satisfied with this. That was great. Obligatory battery install here. Get that in there. Perfect. Reinstall this. Check out how well that worked. This looks tight, but there's plenty of clearance for these wires. And the other side's even better. <laughs> Incredible. It's got the obligatory missing rubber feet. This one's on its way out. Let's see what we can do about that. This one's in the right spot, at least. That's nice. And we'll steal some fresh ones from an Ubiquity hardware kit. Oh yeah. Looks fantastic, brand new. This of course is nice and tight. Doesn't move around, new rubber feet. Really doesn't move around. Little bit bent here, I think still from whatever damage it sustained, but obviously when you're looking at it front on, looks perfect. Super happy. This thing's fully fixed up. Time to take a look at the big dogs. These are identical units. Pix 515Es from 2002. Came from the same company, FedEx, because I got them in the same lot. The guy had, I don't know, at least four of them obviously. And if I would have known anything about these, I would have grabbed a couple of the primaries, but we'll get to that. A couple of other things in the lot actually had these same kind of IT labels, hand-drawn IT labels. So I think I have some Dell monitors that came from the same office. On the front, we have the identical power activity and network lighting, and it gets a lot more interesting on the back. Power in, that's great. Built-in power supply, switch, console access, USB, and the console serial port. We've got our two basic Ethernet interfaces, these are still 10100. And then we've got a failover module installed with this big connector. And the idea there is you have this special Cisco failover cable. You can see one, one is labeled primary and the other end is labeled secondary. So you'd have a primary unit that you'd plug this into. It's operating and doing all your firewall work. And if it fails, apparently we're able to fail over to a passive secondary that then becomes the one doing the work. Now, of course, both my units here are secondaries. <laughs> we'll take a look at that in a second. And then on the left, it gets even more serious. We have some expansion slots. Both of my units have a four port NIC installed. I believe you can just use this for more networking capabilities, of course, beyond the two built-in NICs. And I also believe you can set up a failover via one of these NICs to another machine rather than this length limited cable. So you could fail over to a machine much farther away. Here's the underside. We've got Cisco Secure ACS for Windows NT to show you what type of time frame we're dealing with here. It's got the pretty large cooling fan on the bottom here. And of course mine has the rack ears. So these were racked up, I believe, but they also would have come with rubber feet that you could put in here and put it on a desk or something. Just fired one of those up. It's got the exact same PIX firewall version as the little guy, same BIOS and everything. Kind of interesting because apparently neither of them were ever updated beyond 6.3. This one's got 128 megabytes of RAM, quite a bit more, and you can see a lot more NICs. Herein lies our issue. You can see this large notice when it starts up. This platform is licensed as a secondary failover unit, but lacks connection to a fully licensed primary. Please check the failover connection cable and here it is. This platform will reboot at intervals in its current state. So we can reset the password on this thing, mess around, but because it's unlicensed, you can't use it in any practical manner in this current state. You're not gonna believe this. Somehow, this one has an unrestricted license now. Truly a miracle. Well, here we are logged into PIX CHY Dell FedEx One. The boys at FedEx did not factory reset this stuff when they decommissioned it and it ended up in some guy's storage locker and then I bought it on Craigslist so that's a little sloppy. I did have to reset the password. They weren't totally hopeless. Let's take a look at their config. Show run. They were doing stuff on a 192.168.1 subnet. They had some named computers, admin 301, app 204, app 304 cluster. 
there is no proprietary information in what I'm about to show you, by the way. It's just local IP addresses. They've got the IP of the failover on a totally different subnet. I'm guessing they were using those Ethernet cards rather than the failover cable that I'm going to try. A bunch of PDM locations. Uh, PDM stands for PIX Device Manager. It's a way to remotely manage these things. Maybe we'll try that. And then it's got this inside group of FedEx app servers. <laughs> kind of interesting. And nothing else too interesting. So let's factory reset this thing. Do that with a right erase. Confirm. You're welcome, FedEx. Reload. All right, fully reset. As you can see, it's got the default PIX firewall name now. And what I'm going to do is get this set up just like I got that little guy set up. I'll factory reset the other secondary, and then we'll figure out how to set them up as primary secondary and see if we can do a failover. I've got this unit configured just like we did for the small one. You can see here, able to go on the internet just fine with that Linux machine we were testing on earlier. I think I misspoke earlier talking about the failover. I called this Act Light Activity. It actually stands for active. So if you have a primary failover pair here, the one that's actually performing the work and operating as the primary will light up its active light. What we're going to try to do now is set up failover. So there's a few requirements. They need to be identical models. They need to be running identical versions of the PIX firewall software and they need to have the same amount of RAM. That might cause us some issues. So this primary on the bottom here reports 64 megabytes of RAM. The top one reports 128. So we'll just see if that's weird licensing behavior on the primary and maybe it won't care. We might have to pop the lid off this one and take some of the RAM out. It looks like there's three ways to set these things up for failover. The first and simplest, which we'll be doing, is this high-speed serial cable connected between them. What happens there is if this one loses power or has some sort of issue with its NICs, about 15 seconds later, this one will take over. It loses all the history about what clients were connected and they have to reconnect. There's also a more sophisticated stateful failover that you can do. I think that's what FedEx had set up initially. You can dedicate one NIC on each of these and connect them with a patch cable as well as this still in the mix. And the primary will constantly give client information to the secondary so that when it fails, this one can take over and the clients don't have to reset their connections. And then there's a way to do it over the LAN with these guys and a hub. You connect these through a hub and you can configure it that way and you don't need this serial connection. Here's our sweet new setup. These are our outside NICs. They're on the same network, my existing home network, if you remember from our diagram. And our inside NICs coming into a switch here. And this guy right here is our Linux test machine that we've been using. So they're all on the same network. And then what we do is we plug our failover cable in. This top one is the primary. I moved it to the top here. And we do a little bit of configuration on this guy, basically zero configuration on the standover unit, as I understand. And this guy is going to transfer its stuff to the failover unit via the serial link. Let's check that out. Over here, serial terminal for the primary. Right when it started up, it says failover cable present, so it knows it's there. That's kind of cool. And then it says enabled failover and set standby. And I think we have a couple other things to inform it about. We can get the failover status at any time by saying show failover. So it's off right now, and it knows the other side is powered off. Baby steps, let's enable failover. Okay, show failover. Uh -huh. A little more interesting this time. The other side is still powered off. It knows that this guy is the primary, and it's waiting for a secondary and it doesn't know the IP addresses. So we need to set the outside and inside IPs on the failover unit in the same subnets. Failover IP address inside. Remember our inside is the 10 dot whatever, 10.0.0.2. Then we can say failover IP address outside. Remember that's I, my existing network, the 192 network, 192.168.1.253. Let's do show failover now. On my primary, it's how we set it up before, outside, inside, now the secondary, outside, inside. What I'm gonna do is power up the secondary and hopefully we see some messages about syncing its config. I didn't actually do a password reset on that secondary, as I recall, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I waited a while, nothing. Let's watch this other unit boot up. This is the secondary. Yeah, this one has more RAM, might, might be an issue. Hopefully it tells us when there's problems, we can investigate that way. Now it won't boot. Uh, uh oh, back on the primary. I am realizing I did not write this to memory, all my failover settings. Just for good measure, let's reload it. Okay, the primary is healthy and it knows it's waiting for a secondary. Let's get the serial console on the secondary, fire it back up again, see if that makes a difference. Okay, <laughs> we got stuck before this bio screen last time, so we'll see what happens now. This is the secondary. This is looking good. Remember before our notice was much bigger and this is just saying 
license to run and fail over secondary. It used to say it didn't have a primary. And I think I saw some good stuff up here. Oh, it's just saying, yeah, licensed as a failover. Mm, back to the other one. Show failover. Oh, we're close. Unknown waiting. Hmm. What does that mean? Actually, maybe that's fine because before the cable status was secondary missing. So now what we're going to do is go online with that Linux machine and power off the primary. Wait about 15 seconds. That's the pull time. And then we should get internet again and we should see the activity lights switch on the units. Moment of truth. Got the Linux machine connected here. It's pinging away at Google. Both active lights on the units are illuminated on the front. It kind of has me nervous. But here we go. Turn off the primary. The ping died, of course. And then theoretically, in 15 seconds, we should be running through the standby unit. Failure. I'm going to reset the password on the secondary so that I can actually get into privilege command mode and ask it about failover settings. And I'll read some more documentation. We pulled the password util and now it's saying failed to find an image <laughs> to boot with. We'll see what happens. Let it reboot. No bootable image in flash. I wonder what happened there. Luckily, I've got a copy of the PIX 6.3 binary. Hopefully we can flash that back onto this thing. <laughs> Whoops. We'll just get that on the TFTP server real quick. It's copying the file. I don't even know if this is, if this works. Oh no. An internal assertion check has failed. I need to send this to my support representative. SFMM chip size failed. Uh-oh. Let's just reboot it. Oh boy. Still can't find an image. I know what happened. I used a password reset tool for 6.3. This thing was running 7.x. So that messes up the flash. I need to go find a binary of 7.2. I just loaded a copy of Pix Firewall 701. I think something changed in the arrangement that it puts on the flash between six and seven versions. Yeah, okay. We're unbricked, so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> look at this. So it's it's complaining about its configuration that maybe was persisted somehow. I had this initially on there, and that's how I messed everything up using a 6.3 password reset tool. And it's complaining, hey, the stuff, you, the one you just put on here might not work with this one. Let's reset the password now. That was a little bit of a bonehead move. Let's try to reset the password this time. <laughs> not to be deterred. That's better. I do wish to erase the passwords. That's what I expected to see the first time. No bootable image to, in Flash. Oh my god. Okay, well maybe it reset the password. And I can just reload 7.01 again. Check some verification on image failed. Hmm. Well, the secondary was working. And then I tried to reset the password with the wrong utility. Broke the install, got that fixed, tried to reset that one with what I thought was the right utility, and broke it even worse. We didn't get to see a failover. We saw some failure. But isn't it about the friends at Cisco we made along the way? Even if I had gotten the secondary back online, it's got a newer version than my primary. So I would have had to update the primary. That'll be a whole thing. I'll probably get these working eventually. I'm pretty sure I'm just doing something wrong. And clearly it's possible to recover from these bad flash situations. There's an erase flash bin I saw floating around online, but I can't actually find the bin. Let me know if you know where that is. And basically you can just wipe the whole thing and then get a fresh install on it. But until I get the energy for that, I wasn't really interested in the failover anyway. That was just some, something novel to try out. I'm gonna have one of these in a rack someday with a bunch of my older gear and this will be my firewall, of course not really connected to the internet. Anything you saw me configure is probably not the way you would want to configure your Cisco equipment. That being said, if your real network is running on this PIX stuff, you probably have bigger problems anyway. I bet we'd be shocked to know how much of this PIX equipment is still out there in the wild performing service. These things probably had just tons and tons and tons of hours, fired right up, work fine, aside from me, you know, bungling the TFTP flash, but that's no fault of these units. I had a really good time playing around. I feel a little more familiar with the Cisco ecosystem, which is kind of cool. A lot of the CLI stuff you saw me do with this PIX firewall software is applicable to the modern iOS equivalents in the Cisco switches. But this is probably my last video for the year. So I really hope you enjoyed following along as I messed with these pretty historic machines. I'll see you in the next one.